almost everyone in society is corralled into these jobs where a regulated entity pays them in a regulated way and withholds tax beforehand and their health insurance is tied to that. And you can say, well, is this, it's certainly not consistent with the spirit of the constitution or where this country came from. It's not consistent with the constitution, the idea that two parties interact and somebody else has a right to stand in the middle and track them and take a cut every time they, they do anything. And then of course that drives a lot of exchanges into non-monetary areas and really distorts the economy. And we have all kinds of stuff like that going on. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Monero.com Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on iOS and Android too. Monero.com Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys. And by IVPN. Resist online surveillance with IVPN, a privacy-focused audited and transparent VPN provider that accepts Monero directly. And by Stealth EX, an instant exchange where privacy is the top concern. Go to StealthEX.io to instantly exchange between Monero and 450 plus assets without having to create an account or register and with no limits. Making Stealth EX a simple way to purchase Monero with crypto anonymously. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever. By typing in MoneroTalk.crypto in your Monero.com or Cake Wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Crypto Comic Con, a software developer who shares his bright insights and commentary about crypto and the financial system on Twitter. The two discuss Crypto Comic Con's journey to Monero, discovering BTC's fundamental issues, Exeter's pyramid, the dollar milkshake theory, why the elites need digital cash too, the flaws of Ethereum, tornado cash, why there are no arrests in Monero, stocks, CBDCs, and much more. Monero Talk starts now. I'm hanging out here getting ready to tell you stuff and listen. Uh, yeah, like uh, like we were saying offline, you know, uh, I've seen you around Twitter for, I guess, for, for years now. Uh, always popping up in my tweets, always liking the content you're putting out there. Thank you. I never thought to have you on a Monero talk. And, uh, well, I appreciate the opportunity. Out, said uh, you'd be willing to come on. So this is great. Okay. Um, can I tell you just a little bit about my background? Yes, please do. Get things started here. Uh, I'm the kind of uh, kid who was like in a bunch of AP classes and I would stand up in my English AP class and tell everybody until their eyes rolled that uh, Social Security was a Ponzi scheme, you know, stuff like that. Kind of uh, enjoyed thinking about it, enjoyed a little bit being like a Cassandra type, uh, a kind of classic. And I think that led me to Monero ultimately. So uh, I took a tech job straight out of college, lost some money in the dot-com bust, uh, spent after that a couple of years red-pilling myself before that was really a term the way it is now. Uh, the internet was pretty new and I got into thinking about precious metals a lot and spent many, many hours reading everything. It's just amazing. Even back then there was a ton of uh, content put out by people that, you know, they're in the sort of Rothbard Austrian school mm -hmm. and a lot of conspiracy stuff that had never really seen the light of day publicly until the internet. So it was just, even more unfiltered than now in some ways. Um, it was a major, major messing with my mind for a couple of years as I went down that hole. And um, one thing that happened in the early 2000s as well is um, after the dot-com bust in order to get things moving again, Greenspan lowered interest rates, not quite as low as they became ultimately, but low enough that uh, you couldn't get a bank interest rate 
of, I mean, it was like 0.01% even then in 2003 or so. So around 2004, I had some money in the bank and I'm like, I just started buying a gold and silver. And there was a, a guy that there, there are these local gold and silver dealers, you know, in every community. And my community had one and I got to know the guy and, and accumulated that at a pretty good time in the early 2000s. And um, ultimately got a little discouraged. I just tried to, to trade the futures and got a good lesson in how messed up and manipulated things are some of the same sort of trading patterns that I see starting to happen in Bitcoin after about 2018. Mm -hmm. And that's some of the stuff that I post about on Twitter. But uh, I actually discovered Bitcoin in 2013 wow. when a friend of my son was like bragging about how he'd made money mining it. And so that got my attention and I like, read the white paper and I'm like, whoa, this is legit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had this technical background. I was like, this actually makes sense. I had this background in Austrian economics and all this stuff. But um, it had just taken a face plant from like $256 down to like 90. This was uh, in the first half of 2013. It was a huge bull, bull run. I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, it's legit, but that doesn't mean that it's going to actually be worth anything. This is really cool, but boy, do I want to put any money in this? And then it just started creeping up, you know, and I'd been through this whole cycle with the gold, um, which went up and up and up starting in around 2000 and, you know, through what, 2011, spiked up and went down. And I'd, I'd seen this before. I'm like, okay, this is legit. It's not dying. So I started accumulating then around $100 and on up and um as i as you own something you study it more mm -hmm. so i studied pretty intensely what bitcoin was doing what it was all about this was in the the precursor of the sort of uh, civil war the bitcoin civil war block size day so i was really into that i really understood exactly what both sides were talking about i came to understand flaws like it's not really fungible. It's not private. Um, has diminishing block rewards, so it's you know ultimately going to have a big problem with security. Uh, the static block size limits its ability to process enough transactions. None of these were really big issues yet, but you could see it all. Mm -hmm. And um, so when I discovered Monero was uh, 2015, and I actually discovered it by seeing some videos and I don't know how I got in front of these videos, but they were from a guy named American Pegasus. Oh yeah. Yeah. So you know who that is. It's, yeah. And I mean, he's like, um, he comes across like a sort of drunken gambler <laughs> type in these videos, <laughs> just like raving about buying Bitcoin, I mean, buying uh, Monero and, I was still open enough to, to research it. And I, so I started looking at Monero. I was like, oh my God, Monero actually solves all of these problems that you can see. No one's talking about, but you can see the, all these problems with Bitcoin. So that was my introduction. And I kind of just as a sidebar, um, American Pegasus is a really interesting person. Um, he became a she, Katie Charm. Yeah. And during that process also, I think came into quite a bit of money uh, because of this, this investing in Monero and other things and just partied it away in some really manic fashion. And some of that stuff's online and ended up really broke after a while. Um, but just a, a super interesting person with a lot of stories and you might want to get them on. I'm just yeah, no, I've been trying to get American Pegasus yeah. on for, for years now, for years, from yeah. when I first started this show. Um, I don't know if we ever made, con I think we made contact. Yeah, I don't think uh, she, she was ever interested in coming on, but uh, I'll, I'll keep trying if she, if she's listening. Uh, yeah. Please, so, please, find me, man. Yeah, great, great. yeah, a real, really ahead ahead of 
her time at that point in time. Uh-huh. Yeah. And really kind of talking about Monero in, in ways that, uh, you know, some of us only recently got to, right? And things that haven't come to pass yet, but mm-hmm. more and more people are starting to understand how this might play out, mm-hmm. which I want to talk a little bit more about here, just like everybody else probably that comes on your show. Um, but I'm also, she's an interesting case study in how difficult it is sometimes to go down this rabbit hole and come into some wealth and and understand things and like keep your sanity you know you have to be wild enough to see this but not too crazy and out of control so that you just like throw everything out and going nuts and seeing that everything might be a good thing to invest i mean part of the stuff that she did is give a lot of money to people with projects that weren't ended up not going anywhere. It was a ton of that stuff around 2017, 18. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's really what happened there. Yeah, what was that uh, that coin that she was pushing? Um, uh, oh, I couldn't tell you. But uh, uh, I, I just... It was another Monero-esque coin. Uh, I think it was a four... I'm forgetting the name. Anybody, anybody old school listening is probably... <laughs> realizing it as I speak. But yeah, no, good good point. I mean, you know, crypto is a roller coaster and part part of the uh you know, ability that you need to have is to to hold on tight and not fly off. Yep. <laughs> it, it takes a rare person to like be mentally flexible enough and I mean, willing to watch a video like the ones that she was putting out or he at that time was mm-hmm. putting out and take it seriously enough to actually study it. Exactly. it it's kind of a fine filter mechanism. So it, it, you, when you find people that are early in, you, you identify. There's another person. I was, at a, I was at a gathering before she transitioned. I met her. This was uh, in San Francisco. I think it was 2016, it's the middle of the winter. But um, I met her and also met this guy that, um, gosh, I don't have his name in front of me right now, but he was like an investment banker type of person that made it his vocation to um, explain to private offices and wealthy individuals the value of Monero and just kind of dropped off the radar. He made a bunch of videos. He, I think he was- um, Dr. Kim? Yeah, Dr. Kim. I met him there before anybody knew about him and had a nice conversation with him. Super smart guy, super mm-hmm. um, smooth and everything like that. And I mean, if he wants to be on, he'd be a great guest. Oh know. yeah, we, we've, had, we've had him on, we've had him on. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, he's he's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, he's. I'm hoping he'll he'll make a, a comeback soon in terms of his public Monero persona. But yeah, he, he's an interesting case, and I just wonder why he's gone so silent. And I just think it's it's really hard to get people who are sitting on a bunch of money to. Well, he said it himself in one interview. People are afraid of being embarrassed. Mm-hmm. They're afraid that if they put money in this and it doesn't succeed, they're going to look like a fool. So you're you're dealing with that. And that's part of this mental flexibility and this this willingness to suspend disbelief and actually think clearly about things, which is so rare. And sometimes when it does happen, you just like completely flip somebody over onto some weird state and they can't reason clearly. Like that's that's kind of what happened with uh, Katie Charm, I think. I just, I just find the whole thing interesting. But, yeah, so, um, uh, I was just looking at Aeon, I think it was called the the. Yeah, Aeon. That was was yeah. that the one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it hasn't gone to zero. It's still around. Still around. Still around. Yeah, it's still around. But I mean, there there are a bunch of those sort of affinity coins that borrowed Monero's blockchain. There was one called Masari mm-hmm. that um, Fluffy was like praising it, and that got me interested in it. And the people running that were totally legit and had some interesting ideas, but it just didn't catch on, you know. And oh, Buffy was praising Masari. I don't remember that. Yeah, wow. yeah, wow. he was praising Masari because they came up with um, a different algorithm for deciding 
something to do with the block timing or something like that. And then they, they prov provided that information to Monero, something that could have uh, helped Monero back in the day. And um, that unfortunately with Masari in particular, they came in like at the end of the, of the bull market in 2008, they came in like too late. So everything just like completely collapsed after that. And once you've been pancaked and you didn't get much of a following, it's really hard to recover from that, I think. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good point. I mean, uh, Monero luckily had enough momentum going into that, but even, you know, Monero got crushed pretty well as well, right? They did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. What, what's, what's your, what's your take on that? I mean, you know, you're, you're an early Monero guy. Uh, we saw Monero, uh, in its earlier heyday and now it's, you know, stronger than ever, I'd argue in terms of the, the tech and adoption. Um, but in yeah. terms of its, you know, presence with regards to other cryptos in terms of yeah. where ranked and market cap. How do, well, how do you feel about to, that? To answer that, I'm going to take a little bit of a more roundabout uh, technique because I did I actually went through all this here, and I'm going to I'm going to lead you through a perspective which may be okay. consistent with what you've heard before, may may be somewhat innovative. We'll see. So, I just want to talk a little bit about where the world's at. And we put Monero, Monero in context with that at the end of this. But um, we have what I'm referring to here as an orgy of financial contracts. And these are often referred to as derivatives. And um, they, su they um, support most of the, uh, the debt in the world. And the, the value of these contracts is about $2,000 trillion. Okay. So, um, and all kinds of institutions, when they make loans, they hedge them with these kind of contracts. Um, so that it's really, it's like the insurance policy for all the debt in the world. And then the, the supposed collateral for that is um, people put up collateral for these contracts and the people assume that the counterparties are going to be able to perform. Um, and that collateral is usually in the form of some kind of sovereign debt, uh, typically U.S. Treasury bonds. And uh, that's a $200 trillion market, all sovereign debt. It's maybe 100 to $200 trillion, but it's, it's maybe a tenth or a twentieth the size of the derivatives. And then under that, you have... Um, U.S. dollar-based currency, the M2, which is $20 trillion. So that's another step of 10 down. Okay, and um, so you have this this world. This is this is where we're at right now. And, it's, uh, and underneath that, you have gold, which has kind of been demonetized. It's got about $8 trillion market cap. And, um, but it's been, um, it's been, manipulated so much by these contracts that is the price of gold is not representative of the physical goal. It's representative of the, the way these contracts work. Okay. And we're now in a time when uh, this is all starting to collapse. And in a time when all of these sort of money proxies collapse, have you ever heard of Exeter's pyramid? No. I'm going to, I'm going to send you a link to, the Wikipedia page. Okay, yeah, we, we could put it up and yeah. talk about so, it. Put it in the video. John Exeter was a, um, actually, he was an insider. He was a member of the, uh, he was on the board of, uh, of the Federal Reserve, and this talks about him. But I wanted, if you can bring up the, the, on that Wikipedia page, there's something pretty famous called the Exeter Pyramid. This pyramid, Discuss and at the base of this pyramid I'm talking about here, there's gold. And gold is the, the base collateral for everything. And the, the idea is that each layer in here serves as collateral upon which the, the layer above it is built. So there are all kinds of assumptions that keep this thing from collapsing and keep confidence intact that where you assume that each layer is built on the next one and as the layers start to lose confidence people in those layers and everything collapses down to a question of what is money so at the time when this was put together it was pretty clear that money was gold but gold isn't 
funny anymore. It's been demonetized um, and it's it's been separated from that monetary aspect with the, the futures contracts manipulation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Captured, essentially. Yep. So, um, so keep in mind that um, where we're at now is all the central bankers and investment bankers, they all know this thing is starting to collapse. So they're, they're concerned about how they're going to keep this thing alive. They don't think of like moving to a completely new system. They would much rather find some kind of collateral to put at the base of this thing that would keep all of their monopolies and relationships and monetary situations in place with just plugging a new thing at the base of it that establishes more confidence where you've lost everything. And an interesting thing you see right now is um, the Fed is slowly losing control of interest rates. Um, you see that the, the rate curve is flat. So short-term interest rates are almost are higher in many cases than long-term interest rates. This happens because there's actually a free market in trading these treasury instruments. And um, people don't believe that they have long-term value. So they're discounting. Uh, they, they, well, the point is that um, that is the collateral that serves to uphold the layers above it. And that's actually the collateral at the base of the system right now. And underneath that is US dollar based money. So you're, you're slowly seeing this, this race into the US dollar based money as the safest, most liquid um, asset that can serve as actual money. Uh, I don't know that you've heard about the dollar milkshake theory. That's really what this is all about. Um, there's a guy on Twitter whose handle is Santiago Capital. Um, have you heard about this? Mm -hmm. But you go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Brent Johnson is his name. And he talks about this. So he thinks there's going to be a rush into the dollar. And I think he's right. And it's really a reflection. There's a, there's a loss of confidence in these derivative contracts. There's a loss of confidence in the, the treasuries. They become illiquid. People need dollars ultimately to satisfy the needs that they have. And they, they race into that. And a lot of capital from all over the world is in the process of racing into the dollar right now. But ultimately, there are not going to be enough dollars. And the derivatives contracts are based on assumptions that there are enough dollars to satisfy the obligations, but that assumes that the markets underneath are liquid enough to do that. All of that's going to lock up. It's in the process of locking up, especially in places like England, China. A lot of stuff's happening in China behind the scenes that we don't see. So they're going to have to print money ultimately, a lot of money. And the only way to save this system is going to be to put something underneath that uh, people believe they can't print into oblivion. So I think that there's a pretty good chance that's going to be Bitcoin. Now, I heard in a recent uh, interview that you did, you were speculating with someone saying, well, I think ETH might be better than Bitcoin for this purpose. And I disagree. Okay. And I'll explain why. So never mind the fact that ETH was what I call born in sin. It was a fraud from the beginning, you know, like a lot of religions. But um, the reason that, that Bitcoin is better is because you can run your own node. Um, this is something that I didn't, I mean, I don't actually know the state of this right now, but I can't believe it's gotten any better. It was not long after ETH was birthed until you got to the point where you really couldn't run your own node. And this is kind of what the block war, block size wars were about, being able to run your own node. I think this is really fundamental to being able to trust a currency system a cryptocurrency system. And Bitcoin has maintained that. So Bitcoin has the, the top billing in terms of market cap, but you can also run your own node. So if you're an investment bank, if you're a central banker, and you have to be 100% certain that when you do a transaction or when someone says that they have Bitcoin, that, that, that they can actually prove that they do, you want to be able to run your own node. And 
if there's some question about being able to run your own node or you're dependent on some complicated data center setup or something like that, I think that's a huge liability. So I think that makes something like Ethereum not well suited. But it's not just that. Uh, Ethereum's not viewed as a monetary asset in the same way. It's viewed as part of the system, but the system that it's part of is in direct competition to the financial services industry. And right now, there are rules being put in place that insist that you need to do KYC AML for every person you interact, entity you interact with in DeFi. That's, I mean, that's a direct kill switch on DeFi. So if you, if you don't, if you sort of take away the ability of Ethereum to function and what it's intended to do, and then you say, well, but it's still a better base collateral for this monetary system, which is collapsing. I don't buy it. I just, I don't think that that logic is going to appeal to the people that it really needs to appeal to to save the system. That's why I think that Bitcoin is a much better choice to plug in and provide collateral for the system as it's collapsing. What the uh, fact that, that uh, you know, arguments that Bitcoin really doesn't provide any utility and is, is lacking in long-term stability. Well, the, the stability uh, is a, an issue. Um, I think there are fixes to that, um, especially if it's a fairly constrained pool of entities that are using it. Um, the fact that it doesn't provide any utility is just not reading things correctly. It provides incredible utility. That it provides utility because you can run your own node. Because you can absolutely positively, without anyone else being involved, verify that you own it or that somebody else owns it, and they can prove that to you. And that's super important. In a world where you are trying to stabilize the financial system by printing a gazillion fiat units and I mean, where we've had sort of somewhat transparent financial systems, they'll become more opaque. And they'll just, you know, it's like, what's the, what's the thing that central bankers say? If you, when you have to do something, ultimately you end up lying, right? I, I'm not quoting it quite right, but basically they'll do any dirty trick that they need. And that will ultimately undermine the trust in the currency itself. It's already kind of undermined trust in the derivatives. It's, it's in the process of undermining trust in the, the um, treasuries and the sovereign debt instruments. And ultimately, it makes its way right down into the, the fiat currencies because there's no, there's tremendous pressure to print them at some point and no guarantee that you're not going to, to do that. There's no way to guarantee that you're not going to print them. There's no way to, to verify that what you have now is going to be worth the same thing in terms of the total market cap in the future. That's, that's the reason that something like Bitcoin exists. Now, yeah, let's just back up first. So I always ask this question. So how, how would you define the value proposition of Bitcoin? Uh, Bitcoin is, you know what the total supply is. You know how many there are going to be. I think that's a little overemphasized. And the value is that it's got the network effect where people recognize these properties for it. That's the only reason that it exists. It's, its existence increasingly does not subvert the um, financial system, uh, which has all these complicated contracts and stuff, because there's no DeFi or significant com programmable component. So you, you can define Bitcoin's value in the context of the existing system as it has utility to save that system at the base by providing a new form of trusted collateral. And I think that's the context in which you need to do this. Yeah, that's where I start to lose it because I just, I, 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 I do feel like, you know, uh, something will replace the bottom of that triangle. Um, 
Well, we'll but, get there. But you know, it, it's it's like saying that Bitcoin's value proposition is that it's built to be the thing that replaces the bottom of that triangle, I think is a leap. I don't think it was built for that purpose. I just think that, um, you know, if they're willing to print however many dollars they need to, to save the system, they're ultimately going to be willing to replace the, the base collateral with something like Bitcoin. Now I'm not saying they would do that lock, stock and barrel. Mm -hmm. If you want to, if you want to go back to another time and place where something weird happened, you can look at what happened with the Weimar hyperinflation. The Weimar hyperinflation was, I mean, they, they got into this doom loop where they just had to keep printing and printing and printing money. And ultimately, they put an end to it by revaluing a new currency and saying that it was backed by all the land in Germany or something like that. It was just some really bogus thing that had no inherent actual reality to it, but it was enough. I mean, people were willing to grasp onto something like that because it put an end to this horrible episode of monetary inflation. I think we could well see a situation that's analogous to that here. I guess, I guess what I'm getting at is, is the digital cash aspect, right? So w w would you agree that Bitcoin isn't uh, you know, working as, as digital cash. Oh, totally. And, and because of that, totally, totally. No, I that's guess what my, just, just so, so maybe you could uh, help let's me be clear about what they're, what it. they want to do here. Yeah. So if, if Bitcoin isn't digital cash, you know, then, then does it no longer have a core utility? Oh, it does. Um, they don't, they don't want the public having something like Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the fact that you can subvert Bitcoin because it's not private and not fungible, and you can you can number one identify people who are using it on layer one to interact with other people. As soon as they touch somebody that's that you know who they are, you can unravel the whole network. And the fact that it's got very low capacity, these are all good for this utility. The, the plan right, they, is they more amenable to governments. Well, they no, they they. I think what's going to happen is anybody who spends Bitcoin is going to have to do it. They're not actually going to spend Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. They're going to have Bitcoin that's held by a regulated third party. They're going to spend in quotes Bitcoin, mm -hmm. and I don't, you know, Lightning isn't going to save Bitcoin from this. I mean, I wrote this article on Lightning in 2017 mm -hmm. talking about how it's going to be centralized and there'll be, you know, that that could be one mechanism where people spend, quote, Bitcoin, but it's going to be spent in a very transparent way. So, but having that system, I mean, ultimately, if you don't really own the UXTOs, then they can, they can uh, rehypothecate it, right? So I think they would very much like to do that, like they did to gold and a lot of other things. So rehypothecate or financialize Bitcoin. But in order to facilitate trust between the regulated parties, between sovereigns, they're going to need something like Bitcoin. And the fact that it's not hard to run a node, it, it's absolutely clear who owns what. You can't cheat it. I mean, in a world where we now have the U.S. sanctioning countries and individuals and saying that oh, the, what you own is no longer uh, legal, if you can all agree that, that Bitcoin is legal as long as it goes through the nodes correctly, I mean, there, there, there are these, these slippery things that they can do. They can, they can sanction transactions um, through miners and stuff like that too but um i think it's it's just enough like what they have except it adds guarantees to um i mean it's you can't confiscate somebody's bitcoin the way you would gold it's it's kind of like this fiction that you can create mm -hmm. it's like creating a new religion it's like creating this myth that you know I'm saying all these things that are great properties of Bitcoin, and they are great properties of Bitcoin, and that you can point to them. And then if you don't think too hard, you know, you can, on the one hand, 
convince some people that they ought to allow that into their system. And on the other hand, convince other people that allowing that into the system will really solve the problems that you have with the dollar and stuff like that. So I think it's just like the perfect fit for finessing this. And I think these are not stupid people. I think they're going to go this way ultimately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, yeah, but, but then that's what, what brings me back to something like an Ethereum, right? Because I just feel like maybe it's even a little bit more, uh, you know, aligned with, with what governments ultimately want. Yeah, but that works against people trusting it to use it. You've got two parties here. You've got the ones is, is, that... Is it enough, right? Is there... Are we are we overestimating the amount of trust that, that people need to have in it? Uh, I mean, is it... Well, we're not talking about people. We're talking about large organizations, uh, sovereigns, um, probably yeah, really wealthy enough, individuals. Enough people use Ethereum, and if the number keeps going up... Don't we see that, you know, the, everybody just kind of, it could forgets happen, the, but forgets the little, the little details. And if they KYC AML people that are doing DeFi transactions, then I don't think that Ethereum is going to go up in that situation. And the Ethereum and DeFi, they pose such a threat to the financial services industry, which is heavily politicized. I mean, those guys, they really want to own that layer like they do now, and they want to continue to own it. And they've, they've spent all this money to set it up already. I mean, it's, it's kind of funny because you, you, I don't know that you saw this, but Neil Kashkari, who's, um, I think he's the Minnesota head of the Fed there, he did this interview where he was bashing CBDCs. Mm. Now, it's like, we don't need that. And I'll take him at his word a little bit. I think what he's saying is we already have the all the financial stuff that we built in software and it's centralized. And so why do they want to create a controlled quasi-centralized Ethereum because some people might trust it more than than what they have now? I don't know. To me, that's a leap. Um, once you've given away ability to run your own node and you're dependent at that layer, and then you, you start to identify everybody that's on both sides of every transaction, I that's there's a real tug of war about who's going to control that. It's just much easier to stay with the current plumbing that you have and not go there and do any of that. And it's much easier if you can just plug another purely monetary base uh, asset in and with a story that's good enough and enough people buy into it at the base and then keep everything else the same. I think that's got to be the plan. I'm totally speculating, but that's just my feeling here. No, no. I, I, and they're all, all very good thoughts. And obviously, nobody knows. Anybody, yeah. anybody you know, claims otherwise, uh, you know, doesn't know what they're talking about. Yeah. Um, so... Ultimately, then, where do you see a Monero? What's your okay. speculation ultimately on Monero? So, I was very bullish on Monero from the moment I discovered it. And let me explain what I think is going to happen. And it really hasn't changed since then. So, the people that are running all of this stuff that we have now, I, I would call them uh, high time preference sociopaths. I mean, they're very pragmatic. They don't care what they do to anyone else and they want their money now, you know, and they're, they don't care who they take it from. So for their perspective, it's all about finding the next scam to keep the game going. And that's what we've been talking about here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're not stupid. So if you assume they're not stupid, they have a backup plan. They have some kind of contingency for all of this. So if you look at an example, look at the Russian oligarchs. So these are people who were politically connected when Russia fell apart, the USSR as an empire. And they, they basically strip mined that society. So very much sociopaths. Um, but at the same time, they knew that they were destroying any economic vitality that the area had, their own place where they were born. So what did they do? They moved their money to... Uh, 
England and bought soccer teams. They have Swiss bank accounts, mega yachts, whatever. They moved it someplace where it was safe to store their ill-gotten gains, where there was a working system that was clean and that was separate from what they'd just corrupted and destroyed. So at the end of the game, they needed to get out of that system. And the people that are raping the system right now are in a similar situation. Okay. And Monero fits that bill. Uh, I'm kind of looking at Monero and saying, why has no one tried to really stop this? Seriously, why has no one arrested people that are known figures that are developing it? They have done that to other people. I mean, Ross is still in jail, right? Um, some people have been mysteriously disappeared or killed that have been working on things that are running their super against the dark net market. So the guy that ran Alpha Bay was, uh, he, I don't remember, but he either died or killed himself when they, they caught up with them. So there, there are certain aspects of the monetary system that they're extremely protective of. And yet you have Monero, which is like fueling the dark net markets and no one's going after them directly, even though the tornado cash guy ran into a brick wall there. I mean, I got to think that that was because they don't want Ethereum moving in that direction, right? But why hasn't anyone shut Monero down? Well, they haven't shut it down, I think, because Monero is their contingency plan, or at least in the back of their mind, of enough of these people, they know they're going to need some place to take their money and and put it. They need a way to escape from the system that they've destroyed. So I think you know you'll see the market cap of Monero really start to go up when those kind of people, those sociopaths, start to leave the mothership with their capital. Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans. And if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, gratuitous, and Monero. You know, there's also obviously differences between an open source protocol and, you know, a dark market that's controlled by individuals, sure. right? Sure. What about Tornado Cash? So Tornado Cash starts to skirt that skirt that line a little bit more, and uh, you yeah. know we saw a blowback with it, but it was more of a of an easy target for governments, uh, yeah. and maybe uh, you know maybe they just haven't fully ramped up yet against against Monero. I mean, we're seeing you know governments starting to get more organized in terms of the response to ransomware. I think there was just a summit uh, at the White House the other day with. Uh, yeah countries from around the world and a major part of that topic was how do we you know essentially track and trace all crypto yeah and you know i think that we'll see how that all plays out yeah i'm just i mean they it seems like they have spent some minimal amount of effort trying to break monero the famous irs reward for being able to track it and there was a period of time when a bunch of fake transactions, I think, were being injected onto the Monero blockchain. And there was some guy going around saying, yeah, 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 I, I can see what you're doing on Monero. But in the end, it amounted to nothing. Mm -hmm. So I just think, it, you know, these, I don't, I'm not sure these people that are doing a lot of this stuff are, there's, I don't think there's a, a tightly organized cabal, but I just, I think there's a sense that, maybe there needs to be something at least i hope there is a sense that maybe there needs to be something that we don't just destroy so that there's there's some basis for continued economic activity and when you value when, when you say when you say that sense who's where's that sense coming from you know these the, the psychopaths that you're talking about you're saying there's you know kind of a a, a cabal that's I don't think there's a cabal. These things that are the Russian. I mean, we're not there yet because the market cap is so small, 
Mm-hmm. Okay, but this but is the, say, who, like who's looking out for Monero and saying, "Hold on, hold on, hold on. We may we may need this as a lifeboat." Like who who do you define as as these people? I would say it's more like it's not a priority to crush that. Mm-hmm. Why was it a quiet priority to crush Tornado Cash, but not to go after people associated with Monero? I mean, why is somebody like Julian Assange, who's just reporting, such a target? But Monero is not such a target. I mean, part of it may be because there was this whole cypherpunk movement in the 90s, and they, they tried to ban encryption, right, in the, US, mm-hmm. the United States. And people started doing things like printing T-shirts with encryption algorithm right. code on it and walking around and kind of made a fool of the people that, that did that. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. It's just – it's mysterious to me that it has not received – more flack other than it's most exchanges don't want to deal with it but that's a risk assessment by those exchanges that's not that's there's it's an extremely light touch by the government and i you know i just i think there may be some sense of self-preservation in there i mean it sounds weird but i that's how i explain it I mean, one one of the theories I throw around or things I, you know, is when cash is eventually eliminated and we're obviously moving in that direction because everything's becoming digital, uh, that, you know, the powers that be are going to, are, are also going to need a cash like utility for, yeah for, you know, functioning in, in society. I think people have speculated that, I mean, the, the CIA and the, the CIA may need ways to fund itself, mm-hmm. like what you're talking about with cash, but they would be able to do it with Monero, you know? Yeah. And you have the whole Iran-Contra thing. Um, that was during Reagan's era, but um, I think it was the CIA sold drugs um, so that they can fund an operation in Nicarag- Nicaragua. I mean, there's some really weird stuff that goes on. And I think Monero is very useful to some of these people. Yeah, I also like to think it's because ultimately the law of the land is on the side of Monero, whether governments like it or not. And they would be bringing a lot of attention to it by trying to ban it. And they would be essentially acting like hypocrites in terms of what they're supposed to stand for. Uh, and that it may just ignite uh, more support for Monero as opposed to dampen it out. Yeah, if they try to kill it and fail, they'll look really bad. Mm-hmm. I think that I wouldn't give them as much credit as you do. I just say if they're going to look bad if they can't kill it. That's what that's hearkening back to what happened in the '90s with the cypherpunks. Do you think the law is on the side of it? Like, you know, the Constitution, some of the, the fundamentals uh, of, of the United States, do you think ultimately, you know, free speech, these, these very broad concepts that uh, we call American, do you think ultimately uh, they, they support Monero or they could, you know, there's, w- there's ways of, of talking around those things? Oh, come on. The, the Constitution has been subverted in so many ways. It's just dying. Mean, Look at uh, our whole. Oh, I mean, you could you could talk for a while on the income tax and how that has rolled out and whether that was legal or not. And you know that that's there. You've got an, almost everyone in society is corralled into these jobs where a regulated entity pays them in a regulated way and withholds tax beforehand and their health insurance is tied to that and you can say well is this it's certainly not consistent with the spirit of the constitution or where this country came from it's not consistent with the constitution the idea that two parties interact and somebody else has a right to stand in the middle and track them and take a cut every time they they do anything and then of course that drives a lot of exchanges into non-monetary areas and really distorts the economy and we have all kinds of stuff like that going on so when it comes to money i'm very cynical about this and um, to the extent that it's not being 
harassed. It could be partly that they're embarrassed, but I think also there's an element of it's actually useful. And yet you have these ongoing efforts like Zcash to introduce something that's kind of subverting what Monero actually stands for, where there's some kind of faux version of it. And none of them have caught on, presumably because the public, at least the part of the public that uses these things knows better. So, and it's complicated. It's just something to watch. But if you see the price of Monero really, really going up, there's a pretty good chance that it's, it's some of these rats starting to fear for their, their capital, whether it's capital controls coming in and they just want to move it or they want to, but once you start moving things in an asset like Monero, and of course it's going up like crazy because you're putting capital in it to move the capital, pretty soon you're like, why do I want to even leave this? Right. Exactly. You know? So That's how I ended up here. <laughs> yeah, it's a self-fulfilling profit. I mean, so it seems inevitable unless it's crushed. And so then you have to ask yourself, why hasn't it been crushed? Right, right. You know, why would they even let it live this long and uh, become dominant in the dark net markets? That's a really powerful question. I know. They absolutely could have killed it, given a lot of the other things you see. It's the, it's the ultimate opt out. So do you think Monero is resistant to being co-opted or obviously you think if, if the powers that be wanted to crush it, they can, or do you think it is built in such a way where it, it can't be? Well, I can definitely get it off of every regulated exchange mm -hmm. and things like Binance, they get it off of there probably. Um, if the dark net markets, the asset test, um, I think it would go on in the dark net market. I, they could make it very difficult for the development effort in Monero. Um, but it's not mainstream enough that they can really crush it because not that way, not through publicity because not enough people even know about it. And it's already got a reputation as being the dark net market money. So I don't know. I don't, I don't think they can really stop it at this point. I think, and the, the ASIC, the random X is a really big deal in terms of keeping distributed proof of work mining going. And Monero, that's, I don't think people appreciate just how important that is in making the system unstoppable. I think it would be very hard for them to stop. It would not be hard for them to persecute and make examples of people who have been involved in it, and they haven't done that. So that's interesting. Those people are not as far as, as, far as, as, we, know, as, far as we know, right? And hopefully, as far uh, as we know. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, so I, I think the best defense is offense, which is why I ran for Congress as a, as yeah. a pro Monero, Monero con candidate, uh, hiding out in the, out in the open. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing to be ashamed of with Monero. And I think, I think that's, that's important too. Do you agree with that? I mean, obviously you're like, you're staying anonymous today and completely respect that. And I think that's a very important element of the community that, you know, especially the developer, uh, but do you also think it's important to be out there talking about why Monero, you know, is a positive, why it's ethically, you know, a good technology? Oh, absolutely. And I think the environment is ripe with, uh, for people that want, they're hungry for, basically they're hungry for hope, I would say, because more and more people know how corrupted everything is. And you know, there's, there's, this is one of the big things that they use, sadly, to sell Bitcoin, that it's like going to stick it to the system and it's uncorruptible and all this, which isn't true. So I think it's important to get the message of Monero out there as actually doing these things, because a lot of those people will become disillusioned at some point, and certainly with Ethereum and all of that. So I think for for normal people, yeah, but and unfortunately, we live in a world where capital is so one-sided, it's so concentrated that in order to, to really move the meter, I think it's going to have to happen. Well, this is also because if once the, ca once, the um, once the market cap for something like Monero gets big enough, then it's a rec more recognized as a threat, probably. So um, 
it kind of needs to happen quickly. Um, the grassroots thing might be people people will be more willing to accept it and and use it if the groundwork has been laid ahead of time for that. But the thing that's, that's going to get an actual real mass attention is when a lot of this capital that I mean, it's, and it can be people that have all kinds of money in you know the Cayman Islands and stuff like that start pouring money into it. Uh, I think that will happen and then you'll have a lot of that this you're worried about the political power but the, the people behind the political power are the people that have that kind of money mm -hmm. and so then it becomes the self-fulfilling prophecy and I think what getting more public awareness before that happens will help because people won't see it as just one more scam that was perpetrated by these nasty people to hurt them. They'll see it more as an opportunity. So I don't know exactly the timing or how it all comes together, but I think that educating people now is extremely important for that reason. What else do you think could be done to, you know, help Monero grow in adoption? I mean, is it just a sit in, you know, obviously being out there educating people, uh, waiting for some catalyst that, that spurs people to, you know, opt out and opt into Monero. But do you, you think there's any anything else we can do? Um, well, making it cool is is important, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, the, the people that are holding up signs um, in interesting places, people that are putting stickers all over the place. Um, people are wearing things out in public. You know, that's that's all part of um, the process, I think. Uh, yeah, and, and I think obviously the circular economy, and I think I think people are waking up to that. I'm, I'm feeling more momentum there, more and more, with you know people realizing that Monero is the ideal crypto to use for for transacting. Right. Uh, and a lot of people kind of opening their eyes to that. Yeah, I'm seeing more things on social media where people are starting to question why the government takes a cut of every transaction between two people. And it's like, it's incredible. This is where a lot of the inflation comes from. So as people are bitten by inflation, they're, they're realizing that as you, I mean, it's a lot cheaper to, to get food and make your own dinner than it is to go to a restaurant and have that done. A lot of those expenses are all the taxes that are added. The, the, like the closer you go to the base of production of something, the, the less of an expense you incur through these uh, reciprocal taxes that are all the way along. The line. And people are actually kind of waking up to this. I'm seeing more and more evidence of that. Um, but the only reason any of that works is because we have this sort of regulated financial system that, that tracks everything. I mean, this is this is the more sort of dangerous part of the message, right? Because in terms of threatening the system, but as more people are transacting directly with one another and they no one else can observe it, they, those sort of taxes will go away and the cost of living will go down. I see guys like Jeff Bloom going on, oh, Bitcoin fixes this problem, the one I'm just describing, and he's just dead wrong. Um, Monero fixes this problem. And I call people like that out online. Of course, he's got so many followers, he probably won't respond to anybody that doesn't have 50,000 followers now. So, yeah, but yeah. I do get people's attention from time to time. I think you made a really good point also with that regard right like so the, the people that happen to have these platforms and the, this uh, amazing amount of, of followers are people that really aren't willing to push the envelope and talk about something like monero it's like how they got all those followers to begin with yeah they they end up being like the the typical bitcoin maximalist where right. you're just like got these blinkers on and you're just like throwing out slogans and they don't make a whole lot of sense and then you don't respond when someone calls you on that. So people, I mean, the word maximalist is going to end up becoming synonymous with that kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. But it's it's not the only case. It's like all of these people. And how about somebody like an Elon? You know, I, I haven't talked about Elon in a while, um, but, I, you know, he's he's 
back in the news more than ever right now with Twitter. Yeah. But what's with the Dogecoin and why not Monero? I mean, this guy was an old school, you know, he was a PayPal guy. And when the original intent of PayPal was to be essentially decentralized digital cash before they could figure out how to, how to do that, how did he miss Monero? Or is there something intentional going on there? Yeah, I don't think that he wants to be the... He's got too many regulated entities that he's involved with hmm. in the U.S. and in China. He's got a lot to lose by um, pushing something that would subvert the collection of income taxes. I mean, I guarantee you his employees, they're all W-2 employees. They all come into the office. You know, that's a big thing for him. And they're they're doing that. Of course, they don't pay any corporate income taxes because they've got a Bahamas office that does all their R&D or whatever, you know, officially. So, I mean, the system is, it's easy for someone that's building businesses and has a lot of money. They're not really the victim of this. And um, it doesn't prevent him from doing what he wants to do. And in some sense, the way things are keep employees in line. So you can insist that they come in and work ridiculous hours and a lot of other things to be associated with your organization. The The kind of freedom that we're talking about with Monero really is revolutionary. And it's the kind of, it rubs me when I hear Bloom talking about Bitcoin doing this. Like I said, he's wrong, but Monero really can unleash a lot of um, latent capability that people have, people just don't have the incentive to do a lot of things on their own right now, or they, they do them outside of the economic system. And I think as, as things get more and more corrupt, you'll see bigger black markets, not just in things like drugs, things that are illegal, but even things like food. And um, that's just, that's not somebody like Elon's bailiwick. He's mm -hmm. making rockets and selling them to NASA. He's making cars you know and aligning himself with the the esg movement so he <laughs> pro free speech man yeah pro pro elon acting like a clown and getting away with it in some yeah. sense you know it's there's a pro owning a, a you know a powerful media outlet i think is right it really is right i think his He's, his I mean, of being pro free speech as a way of you know convincing the people i mean there, there's a lot i like about the guy but i don't think that neither elon nor the existing government systems that we have are going to be our salvation in this and it's going to be ugly the way it plays out in my opinion and when when the capital really does come there's going to be questions about whether it's a legitimate system or not so it's important to to lay the groundwork of this is we're actually the good guys Definitely, definitely. Sometimes I ask myself that. Are we, you know, are we the baddies? <laughs> a lot of people would say so, but a lot of those people are so hopelessly tied into the system that we have right now that they don't, they're very myopic about things. Yeah, unfortunately, I do think there's there's going to be more, there is going to be a, a very strong battle that takes place against Monero at some point in terms of fighting against it and saying, you know, it's used for ransomware, it's used to fund terrorism, and there's going to be a strong political attack, I, I believe. Oh, I think you're right. Point. At some point. Um, we uh, You mentioned CBDCs, but do you potentially see that as being the, the tip of the extra pyramid? Is there some scenario where... No. There's some CBDC that's federated that, you know, governments are, are aligned and behind and it's, you know, it kind of, it's, it's, you I know, think maybe pseudo open source, you know, people can, can trust that there's only going to be, you know, so many produced or there's an emission schedule, whether or not, you know, there's back doors, who knows. Do you think there's something like that that can fill in that niche? Yeah, I just, I don't think so. I mean, they have the CBDC type system in China mm -hmm. and it's, it's all about regulating the behavior of individuals. And in terms of uh, China has a big problem with um, 
communicating currency value with the outside world because their their banking system is totally corrupted by giving out loans to build ghost cities and stuff like that. It's just like really, really messed up. Um, that's actually the problem that they need to solve. Um, they've got people in the West are, are locked into, I've been talking about a little bit, these W-2 jobs and the paying income tax and all the money flowing through regulated entities. They've already got what they need there. And I think that when Kashkari is talking against CBDCs, he doesn't see that as necessary and that we already have sort of, I think, what they would call the right level of regulating individual people in terms of the money that they spend. But what's what's missing is institutional trust. That's that's what fell apart in 2008. That's what was falling apart in 2020 when they printed a few trillion dollars. And that's what's falling apart big time now with um, the interest rates going up into markets that can't afford to pay more interest. So um, there's we're heading into currency crises. And the most important issue in keeping the Humpty Dumpty system together is to have some base collateral that can engender confidence among people that are not just naive, ordinary folks, that, but actually people who understand the problems. And I think that's why there's a fairly decent chance that Bitcoin will be used in that regard. And I think undertaking CBDCs, I just don't think that they feel like they need that. They've already got the system that they want. I mean, the, the U.S. is pretty locked down in some significant ways. I mean, we'll see after this election and the, the one in two years. But um, you saw what happened in, in Canada, too, with the, the truckers and all that. that mm -hmm. they, they dealt pretty harshly with the individuals there, and they weren't using CBDCs. Of course, some of them were using Bitcoin, but they were closing out bank accounts and stuff, too. Yeah, I, I think the CBDCs are not about making people confident and giving people services they need. I think they're really about controlling people. And it's a lot of effort that's not necessary in the West from the perspective of the people that are running things right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess my, my fear is that they'll just trick people into using them out of you know reasons of security and, and convenience. I think they might trick people into using... Bitcoin accounts that are hosted, and then they might rehypothecate those mm -hmm. while telling people that they're actually own Bitcoin. You know, um, that's that's happened before. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of the model you're looking at here. China had to sort of build everything up from nothing, but we have a hundred years of this kind of financial engineering moving in one direction. I don't think they're going to turn it all around. How about the the economy? Uh, what, what, what's your take? I mean, things things are crazy right now. It feels like we're we're walking on we're on the edge of a cliff. Um, what's what's your take on the economy? Uh, I'm markets. I'm sh not. I don't like being short things, but I do own puts on things like the S and P five hundred. And there's a lot of talk about how the put side was too crowded. But what I'm seeing is a series of bear market rallies. And uh, we people like to point out that the, the volatility index, the VIX, is still low. Um, the fact that the volatility is relatively low means that we haven't received a capitulation event yet. So, and I, I really think that to whatever extent they're able to control it, like releasing gasoline from the reserve and um, there's actually some some uh, repo action going on in the treasury market lately that's helping to support stocks i think until the election you're going to see that uh, after the election particularly if the republicans win a lot more dominance in the house and senate mm -hmm. but it probably in any case you're going to see the true bear market come and it's it's not if the fed i mean the fed's gonna have to turn on the money printer at some point but this is an ugly game this is the dollar milkshake thing now this is an ugly game where the fed can play chicken a lot longer with interest rates than anywhere else um and 
it will force money into the U.S. Treasury market ultimately. Well, force money into the dollar as interest rates go up. Money will start going into the Treasury market, especially as the stock market goes down because people will be afraid to go there. This is your classic, you know, bear market thing, except it's going to be huge, I think. And you're going to have people pouring money into Treasuries at five, six, seven percent or whatever it is. It's going to stay there for a year. And but it, there's going to have to be some huge effort to reconstitute the system, which is going to involve a lot of money printing. Once that money's in there at those kind of interest rates, maybe it'll be a little bit lower. You're going to have fairly high inflation with money printing. Lynn Alden's a really good source for this. She's big on Twitter. She talks about now being like the 40s, mm -hmm. where interest rates were kept underneath the rate of inflation for a long time. Except we've we've had much worse sort of dislocation of the production capacity, and we're going to have to reshore things from China. So this, it's going to be more production constrained. Uh, hopefully, we don't have a war. Um, but I, at some point, they're going to be printing a lot of money, and the bonds, even the U.S. dollar bonds, are going to be under the rate of inflation. So I think we're going to see inflation for a while. You could see things like gold and Bitcoin really run at that point, and that's when they start bringing things like gold and Bitcoin back into focus as some way of backing up the currency after the reset or whatever they want to call it. And I think that the indication will be more toward um, Bitcoin because they have more control over physical Bitcoin and there's, it's more flexible. And China owns a ton of gold. They own like 20,000 tons of gold, actually, which is probably 25,000 tons. It's more than the U.S. ever owned, even at the peak. And the U.S. says it owns 8,000 tons. We probably don't, although we hold other people's gold that we could confiscate in a bad situation and might do, but that would further damage our reputation. So this is the environment. Um, do you, I mean, currently, you know, Bitcoin's been acting as a, as a risk on asset, right? And it's correlated with the market. Uh, so are you saying, am I hearing you say that maybe there's a scenario where, you know, the market crashes, continues to go down, stagnates, stays low, and but Bitcoin starts to, to come back up as people move into it, realizing that yeah. you know, it's the only way to fight inflation? Unless, unless there's an effort, which would not be hard to uh, lock Bitcoin out of regulated exchanges and stuff like that, I think that's almost inevitable. So if it happens, it will be a choice you'll see inaction on the part of the regulatory bodies and they'll allow Bitcoin to rip, but they will have purchased a certain amount of it ahead of time, or they, they might even get this stuff into the regulated bodies and then say, guess what? You have to, you have to keep that, you know, 20%, 50% of that on deposit at the federal reserve or whatever. And, then that becomes the collateral behind the currency system. There's a lot of games they can play once they get it into the regulated environment. And they, if they want to do that, they're not going to want to destroy the confidence in it. Quite the contrary. So. Crypto Comic Con, man. Thank you. Thank you so much. You bet. Uh, uh, this is, this is awesome. It's like, uh, you know, so much better than reading your, your tweets are amazing, but I got to, you know, now I got the, a full expanded view. Well, thanks for um, giving me the chance to talk to you. I enjoyed it. Yeah, you're you're highly underrated on on Twitter in terms of I think the amount of followers you have. I like this, yeah. you know, there there seems to be strange reasons behind that. Um, the correlations between the amount of followers somebody has and who's actually you know dropping alpha, who has like some you know the real the I real. I don't know. I'm just not good at promoting myself, but I'm not really that concerned about it either. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, I, I didn't mean it in those terms. I just, I, no, just, you know, I like, uh, you know, the, the I don't take market, it as an insult. <laughs> the market, the market isn't fair on, on Twitter. No, right? it's there's a lot of ridiculous garbage that gets. Uh, I mean, look at the Kardashians. It's just like ridiculous what people 
glom on to. Yeah, I mean, look, look at us. Look at our Monero talk. Monero, I mean, our, our, our YouTube channel is, you know, yeah. at 7,000, 7,500 subscribers for, you know, the last the last year. It's 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 odd. It's strange. It uh, is. Hopefully it'll change. Yeah. But we'll, we'll, we'll keep uh, exploring. And people, people will look back historically at these and be like, holy shit. These guys are right. Well, hopefully we'll have something to be proud about. <laughs> All right. Pat. Greatly, greatly appreciate it. And uh, yeah, hopefully we stay in touch. We'd love okay. to you know, everyone to jump on a Monero Topia episode. By all means. Sounds good. Thank you. All right, crypto. Oh, any anywhere, anything you want to put out there in terms of where people obviously they can follow you on Twitter. Any 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 other websites or things you want to put out there? Um, you know, I've got this project that I'm working on, um, which is it's kind of technical. Maybe I'll talk about it another time. It also has some relevance to whether ETH is necessary or what might actually be better than Ethereum. But um, let's do that another time. That's uh, on my Twitter profile page if you want the information about that. All right, buddy. Crypto Comic Con. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to our show on YouTube, Odyssey, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Go to MoneroTalk.live to subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.